Well, good morning. Um, my name is Rob Harris. Um, my job is to do with designing buildings for the performing arts, primarily. And as a designer, I'm very interested in the buildings that we'll be creating and rehearsing and performing music in in the future. And I think we have a common interest in ensuring these buildings continue to, to be sustainable and to attract an audience so that we have buildings to produce music in and we carry on having buildings to design. So this morning, um, I feel that if... Uh, I'd start off by saying that a concert goer at the end of the 19th century would probably feel fairly at home in today's concert halls. It would be a similar experience. I suspect that won't be the same in another 100 years. And the question is, how do we respond to these changing times and, and challenges? So uh, I'm going to try and introduce a few thoughts on that this morning, and perhaps we'll have time, hopefully, for a few questions or discussion at the end. Um, a year or so ago, the American Association of Museums commissioned a report into the future of museums. And in the introduction, the director said, to forecast the future is to explore new territory. We start with certainty, i.e. where we are today, but each step takes us further from our projected course. We think where we know we are going, but what might, might, what might make us change our course? What unexpected obstacles may appear on the map? Will there be some seismic event which will change the landscape? And she said that the centre of the future museum's charge is to help museums' projects consider where their future courses may lead, where they actually want to go, and to anticipate the forces that may throw them off track. So rather ambitiously apply the same sort of thinking to um, today's presentation. Um, I've given this talk once before, and uh, I talked about the next generation. And somebody reprimanded me and said we should also think about the current audiences, so perhaps we should broaden that a little bit more. But essentially, how do the needs of the next generation of audience inform our planning and design of music venues uh, and indeed wider performing and visual arts buildings. And I want to talk about it in, in three contexts, really. The first one is affordability. And there's two senses of affordability, I think. The first one is personal affordability. I mean, we all know it's difficult times. We don't know what's going to happen to the euro. There's a high unemployment in Europe and so on and so forth. What can people afford to do when they go to see a music performance? Will they be able to afford to go to the building or will it something they'll do online or at home? And more widely, there's societal affordability. Uh, I've benefited in my company from a lot of very ambitious buildings like this one we're in today being constructed over the last 20 years. Can we as an industry afford this? Can society afford these big performing arts buildings? Or are we going to have to look in a, another direction? And that takes us on rather neatly to sustainability, uh, both sustainability in the sense of the energy bills in our, in our concert halls and music theatres, but also the sustainability of these, of these operations altogether. And finally, in terms of these audiences that are important to all of us, how do we attract them? Um, our buildings have to be accessible to young people. They want to, have to want to come into them. When they are here, my suggestion is they want to interact with the building. They don't want a passive um, experience like audiences have done in the past. And probably, indeed, they want to participate while they're inside the building. So going through those, let, let's, let's, uh, let's take these. This, some of you recognise this, the new opera house in Copenhagen, which I was involved with the design. But can the society in Europe, and indeed the planet, <laughs> afford many more of these? And I refer to the Formula One analogy. You know, there's often the argument you shouldn't race these cars around that use huge amount of power and this great circus that flies around the world. But perhaps at the bin very pinnacle of what you do, you can afford some of these. But certainly we need to balance our worldly expenditure, both in cash terms and in carbon terms, 
with what the needs of the artists and the visitors are. Um, a Vinoli uh, in the UK recently opened the architect a, a new gallery in Colchester and the Architects Journal said the cultural building boom of the past decade is over. Well, that's certainly true in the United Kingdom, but we are seeing a lot of countries or country leaders who are looking to build arts buildings for prestige, rather what we call the Bilbao effect after the, the Geary building there. And the risk is that the arts content, whether it's music or visual arts, is a rather secondary. And we're seeing perhaps a demand for music buildings, not for their music, but as architectural icons to boost visitors' investment and business in the city. And you could argue, perhaps, have some of our recent great architectural buildings actually upstaged their content. Often the building is as big a draw as the art or the performance inside. And where's the balance here? On affordability, here's a couple of things we've been building that maybe we might not be able to afford. The image on the left is a bit obscure, but it enters into a very large reverberation chambers, <clears throat> which some of my competitors uh, build on their concert halls. Um, I'm not going to debate here the, the value of that acoustically, but it certainly adds a huge amount to the area of the building and the energy needed in constructing and running that building. And the one on the right is one I was involved with. This is the side stages at Copenhagen Opera. And as opera as an art form develops, us designers get more and more enthusiastic about building bigger and bigger, more expensive and more complex facilities. And the question is, in the short and medium term, can we afford to carry on doing this? And does the art really need it? Here's an example, and if anybody's here from Reykjavik, but the, the beautiful new concert hall in, in Reykjavik, Harper. Uh, Reykjavik's uh, got a pop, um, population of 200,000 in a country with a population of 318,000. Of course, this concert hall was designed when the Icelandic banks were running the world, and now they've crashed, so it wouldn't happen now. My understanding, certainly when I was there, that unfortunately the facilities currently rather exceed the repertoire, although they have some fine local performers. Uh, certainly when I was there, they couldn't afford the international touring orchestras uh, which the building would, um, would support. But of course there is in a way a solution uh, which is that they have lots of other rooms and I understand that you know, with weddings and dances and everything else the conference facilities are, are booked up for the next five years. But of course the opera house that was going to be next door has never uh, materialised. Here's another one. Uh, Perhaps more relevant to uh, America than, uh, than the UK, as you know, the tax, uh, than Europe. The tax regime is different in America. You get a lot of personal naming uh, by rich people. And here's a classic one where you have your name right away across the front of your, your concert hall. But if I'm right, then economics and environmental politics may be driving us towards less assuming facilities than this, less impressive facilities. Will the philanthropists still be interested in these, or will some of them direct their money elsewhere? Um, some of them will continue to want prestigious architecture on which to literally, in this case, hang their names, but maybe some enlightened ones may seek a package which includes the, ice, the iPad apps alongside the glass and the steel. This is a new theatre that we were involved with in the UK. It's called the Waterside Theatre in Aylesbury. And it has one of these electronic acoustic systems such that it can be used also occasionally for symphonic uh, music. The problem is, in my mind, it's a very conservative programme. Um, those of you from the United Kingdom will know that there are certain shows which go round and round. And if you miss them in one city this year, you can pick them up in the next city next year. And the point I'm making is that in these sort of recessionary times, <clears throat> the arts can tend to be rather conservative in some places in their programming or the arts management can. And the risk is that as building designers, we kind of follow this trend and we don't imagine, um, you know, the art that will be driving our designs in the future. And of course, some of the best art emerges, doesn't it, in difficult times and in unlikely spaces. 
uh, opera companies like the New York Met and the Royal Opera in London and uh, other companies within Europe, symphonic uh, orchestras and so on, do live relays. <clears throat> National Theatre in London does it to many cinemas. There's an interesting question, though, that is the ambience and the food and the offer in the cinema appropriate to those audiences? Do they want to you know, eat the popcorn while they're listening to the papaya is the sort of question. Um, it may well be that, you know, this, this building's a good example of... It has multiple auditoria. I'm not having to give this presentation in the main concert hall much more appropriate in this, in this forum. But maybe in the future we have to work harder and have fewer auditoria in our performing arts centres. As designers, it's much easier for us to say... Uh, you must have a concert hall, you must have a recital hall, you must have a drama theatre, you must have a black box. But maybe we're going to have to compromise a bit on that. And that, of course, would mean compromising the very highest acoustic standards. But perhaps we can't afford that. Um, there's various uh, uh, technical developments, uh, steerable loudspeakers, low-frequency sound absorption, and so on can help us with that. A lot of modern music audiences want to dance, but it's very difficult for them to do that in many auditoria. Here's a hall which I was involved with in London called King's Place. And you can see, you know, there's the 7 o'clock classical recital audience mode and there's the 10 o'clock jazz audience mode. And it's very easy to change the hall in its ambience and its attraction to different audiences. Should two performances per evening be more commonplace? The iTunes generation downloads tracks, not albums. Do they actually want an overture, the difficult piece in the middle and the old friend symphony at the end? Or do they just want a 45-minute concerto and then they'll go on to do something else in the evening? I don't even know if there's a financial model that allows that to happen. Uh, but is, what are the implications for our buildings? Uh, should more of our concert halls be open after midnight? And as designers, we need to be very rigorous when a client comes to us for a new music building and not just pick up the, the programme or the brief from one we did five years ago and copy it on. Perhaps we'll have fewer arts buildings. Perhaps we'll have more music and art in the public realm. It could be argued that too much art is seen and heard by too few people in too few places. Perhaps we need more art and performance in our shopping centres and our car parks. The, uh, in the United Kingdom, the Arts Council <clears throat> of England has awarded R&D grants for digitalisation of the arts. And it means as designers we're going to have to make our buildings more sophisticated to allow um, for these systems. It also means that our designers, including people of my age, have got to understand, embrace and be inspired by this new technology. And so do our clients. And our commissioning clients for concert halls tend to be middle-aged people um, with quite conservative views. Again, on affordability and also access to people, maybe perhaps we'll see a trend towards more temporary buildings for performance. Perhaps we'll see a trend to use more reuse of buildings, either uh, temporary reuse or permanent reuse. And we probably all know that many audiences find what we might call found spaces a, a very attractive um, uh, way of um, enjoying the performing arts and can be very interesting for artists and producing companies as well to produce something in a space which wasn't designed for performing arts. Designing for minority use, what I mean by this is that normally... Um, if you want to build a hall in a community, the people that are going to fund it and be behind it are going to be the people interested probably in classical music. And that's what's going to get it through the local authority and the council. But actually, the classical music is going to be a minority use. It may be, in some senses, the most important use, but it's certainly not going to fund the operation. And um, music, amplified music, conference, cabaret, these are the uses which are going to support the intended prime use of classical or symphonic music. This is another hall we were involved with. It's the, Melbourne, it's the Elizabeth Murdoch Hall in the Melbourne Recital Centre. 
but it's tried when it opened to have an almost entirely classical music program and it just simply even in a city like Melbourne could not sustain the audiences for a 1200 seat hall so people have to be very aware really when you design a new building like this you've got to design for many different types of audience sustainability some of this is obvious um, low energy use is obviously important the project on the left is one of the many theatres now which use natural ventilation uh, to save energy. The one on the right, not very attractive architecturally, but it's the world's first ultra-low noise uh, naturally ventilated TV studios, actually for Sky TV in the UK. And our music buildings in the future will increasingly use, of course, energy saving design, passive design, and also energy saving uh, um, technology. We must work with nature in the design and use of these buildings. Here's an example. Um, those of you familiar with music theatre, so of course, there's two types of flying system in fly tower for suspending scenery. The one on the left, the conventional hand-operated counterweight system. The one on the right, the power flying system. The one on the right has many advantages, but of course, it needs more energy in the first place to be built. It needs more energy in operation, and I bet it will be replaced sooner than the one on the left. So perhaps some of these discussions, which have always gone to the high technology, will have to come back towards a more balanced consideration of what's most appropriate. Another thing we can do is, 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 is reassess in our design the specifications of the building. Um, this is an example, actually, from the art gallery world rather than the music world. And these images are of the, uh, the V&A, the Victoria and Albert Medieval Galleries in London. Um, my colleagues uh, designing the services of this uh, specified lower temperatures in winter than would generally be thought appropriate because by doing so, they don't have to control the humidity and make very, very significant energy savings. So maybe the staff have to wear a, wear a jacket, um, but there's a, a complete change in... Um, in the energy use. Another example, there's a, in the museum world, there's a group called the Bezo Group who are responsible for loaning artworks between galleries. And they had set very significant environmental um, considerations and requirements you know, on w when they lend one work of art to another. And they've, they've started to reduce this because it's too expensive for people to meet this and it, and it uses too much energy. Another thing we've done very much in the 20th century is, and probably the 19th as well, you know, we build a museum, you can see this here in Munich, and then we build an art gallery, and then we build a concert hall, and then we build a theatre. Interestingly, in Munich, we build three theatres pretty much next to each other. Um, but there is a bit of a trend now to um, combine these facilities, which I think is, is, is very helpful. The example on the left is King's Place, which was that chamber hall I showed you earlier, which could change its appearance, which is not only a performing arts building, but it's a visual arts building, <coughs> excuse me, and it's set within a commercial development with some major office uh, tenants and, and catering and so on. And there's a number of new projects which I'm aware of now which are recombining uh, the visual and the performing arts in, in one uh, building. And it seems to me there's a real synergy there in terms of the arts experience for people um, when you go to a building to experience uh, uh, both forms at the same time. For hard-pressed uh, arts organisations, of course, there's also a cost saving in, in, in sharing um, uh, some of the building uh, staffing costs. Um, some of you will know that probably the major performing arts uh, project that's going to happen in the world in the next 15 years is the West Kowloon development in Hong Kong, which is going to include some major new concert halls, opera houses, theatres, art galleries... And in their briefing paper, the client says, the development of West Kowloon creates an opportunity to provide a multidisciplinary context for arts and art-related activities that can intrinsically foster energy between what have been largely treated as separate types of artistic endeavour, both by audiences and by practitioners. So there seems to be some support for my thesis about uh, synergy there. 
Um, there's a new London Gallery extension opened a few years ago, and one of the newspapers said, uh, described it as another great cafe with a gallery attached. Um, we've got a client now, we're, we're designing a prestigious, prestigious uh, new cultural centre, and he, it's um, for a certain uh, um, world culture, and he's very interested in doing food presentation because he sees food as part of the cultural offering uh, as well as um, the performing and the visual arts. And why not? I mean, catering brings life into the building um, throughout the day. Of course, the programming itself can, can do this within the building we've already got. Um, here's a couple of examples of, of sonic art in, in art galleries. Uh, the Sonic Rainbow at the Museum of Modern Art in New York and Bill Fontana's um, uh, a, a project where people could listen to the Millennium Bridge inside Tate Modern. And for us as designers, that increases our thinking about the technology that we need to put into these buildings. And the other way around, of course. Um, more visual art in, 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 in music centre buildings, going beyond perhaps just the token you know, photographic display on a few stands. There could be more of this, I think. This is the New World Symphony in Florida, some of you may be familiar with. Um, which is very interesting because it's probably the first concert hall very much designed with uh, multiple um, screens and the idea of, of um, very effective use of lighting and of video and so on during uh, symphonic performances. And I think there's some very um, important and interesting work uh, coming out of that. And going back to Harper, I mean, here, here, here's the... The visual art actually is part of the building. The whole of the facade of that building is an artwork by um, Olifer Eliasson. Uh, so then I'd like to come on to perhaps a little bit more about um, these, uh, the new generation. Um, younger people make social choices uh, much nearer the event uh, than people of my generation do. I mean... My wife and I decided I'd go to a concert. We probably booked the tickets three weeks in advance. When my teenage children go to a concert, they normally design about six o'clock what they're going to do at eight o'clock. And what's very important to them is their social group. And I think that it's very important that um, our venues are places which they will go to as a destination. If they're happy to go there as a destination, uh, then they may well start to sample the goods when they're there. And that means they get free Wi-Fi. It means they get fair trade coffee. It means they don't get a security guard eyeing them up because he doesn't like the look of their hair or their, their clothes. Um, and a cafe, for example, you know, which is something that says Costa or Starbucks or something which they feel happy to go into the building, maybe the cafe comes through the facade, I think is very important. It's, it's getting people into the building. If I go back to that uh, American Association of Museums report, it says there's a rapidly emerging consensus that the most successful museums for the future will be places to hang out, engage and contribute, museums that blur the boundaries between back of house and the public side. There's a um, sort of online advocacy group in the UK called um, Younger Theatre, and the founder, a gentleman called Yake, Jake Orr said, I can't help but think that there is a distinct feeling among young people that the way these theatres are built becomes somewhat of a barrier. I have often referred to the Royal Opera House in London as a fortress. It's an impenetrable, impenetrable building except for those who are in the know of what lies beyond. I think smaller theatres have it easier. They strip away the grandness of what theatre used to be and bring forth the idea that the magic on the stage lies, lies behind a thin wall, almost a curtain. And I think that's true. I think we've, we've got to make these buildings very, very open um, to young people and, and use that to help, you know, dissolve any remaining perceptions of elitism in, in, in the performing arts. That's a project, incidentally, in Singapore called um, Genexis, which I think is a nice example of the sort of place that... Um, people would be happy to be photographed on their smartphone in. 
Um, young people, I think, also want to interact with the world and control their experiences. And I think they want a music experience that begins before they leave home, on iTunes probably, continues at the music venue, both live and by electronic interaction with what's being presented, and perhaps continues after they've left the building. And the response to this, I think, is largely with artists and the technologists within the buildings, but our buildings must meet their needs. I think an important point is that to young people, digitalisation is not innovative. It's routine and expected. Live Nation, you know, the producers, has 23 million followers. This will be the norm from now on, as will be a place to meet, to do things, to participate and have faster experiences. There's a light sculpture near where I work which you can reprogram off your mobile phone by texting it. And perhaps we should extend this more to our public spaces. So I've talked about accessibility, I've talked about interaction. The last one, if you remember, was um, participation. And I've said here many more, in brackets, young people play music than go to concert halls. Many more people have a digital camera than a pass to galleries. So will our music buildings be more participatory? Will they include integral music teaching? One of the things that disappoints me is we very rarely get asked to include in one of our prestigious, expensive buildings some very cheap places that people, the local rock band could go and practice or the local string quartet could go and rehearse for free or at low cost. The um, picture on the left is the Sage at Gateshead, some of you may know, uh, prestigious performing arts music thing. And it's the only one in the United Kingdom that has, a, I know, has an integral uh, music school. Um, and they engage very much with the community by getting their, you know, visiting artists to give uh, workshops and so on to, to people. And I th um, when I was at Harper, Bjork was there, she was teaching children music and science, sitting around with their iPads. So I think if people go to a music building from an early stage um, and learn to play and learn there, then it would be very natural for them to go there as an audience uh, as they get older. Uh, I worked on a refurbishment of a, a concert hall in Europe, I won't say which country, and I was talking to the director and he said he followed two uh, teenage girls into the, the auditorium. One said, do you come here often? And the other one said, no, it's full of old people, it smells funny. <laughs> I think what she was really probably could smell was the sort of 1960s polished wood, but uh, we've got to change that experience, I think, in, in, in some ways. And I think it could be that the visual arts uh, are perhaps a bit ahead of the performing arts uh, in terms of the inclusion of educational spaces. You know, a lot of art galleries have learning spaces where live events, participatory activities, workshops, etc., uh, happen. We could see that perhaps more in some of our music, um, music venues. One more recent example where it does bring to life is in Helsinki, in the Music Italo, where the concert hall has the Sibelius Academy right in the middle of the building. And that certainly enlivens the building uh, during the day. Um, a welcome trend um, in the UK is, uh, and perhaps elsewhere in Europe, is, is a trend to be building combined school and community performance buildings, you know, where the funding allows for school use, but also use by the community in the evenings and weekends. And this again makes young people, I think, feel part of you know, a, a, a larger cultural experience. Um, most of our concert halls have shops. Some of them are very appealing, others I think are rather dusty. Um, and you know, will they appeal to younger buyers? When will we see an Apple store, for example, in a concert hall? And of course, the biggest complaint always to building designers, uh, why are there never enough toilets, particularly for the ladies? This doesn't seem to change that problem. Uh, and sort of to close, there's an interesting question is, you know, I've talked about the next generation of audiences as though they're different. I think they are different, but will they become the same 
as they get older. Um, I attended my first classical music concert uh, about 40 years ago, and I was certainly the youngest there. Um, I went to one last week, and I was still younger than 90% of the audience. <laughs> now, I've read some people saying we shouldn't worry because there's a big audience there of 50, 60, 70 year olds, the you know, post Second World War um, audience, baby boomers. So we can be relaxed. You know, it's, it's great times. There's this huge audience, but will they regenerate? You know, will they will they come along? Do people wake up and say, "Look, I'm 50. I must like Beethoven string quartets and the early work of Botticelli." And I'm not sure. I'd be interested to know people's opinions on that. I'm not sure whether that happens or not. And I think this needs change. Uh, I think we do need to change uh, for these audiences. And we can do our bit as building creators, but I think also the producers and the artists need to change. And controversially, I suggest particularly some of the classical music musicians and conductors need to rethink how they present themselves. So just to summarise um, what I've been uh, discussing, um, our music buildings in the future, I believe, have to be affordable in multiple ways, i.e. both personally to people and to society. They have to be sustainable in terms of energy in use, but sustainable in terms of the energy and space they use to construct them. And as far as new audiences are concerned, or even retaining existing audiences, they have to be attractive places to go. They have to be interactive. There has to be more that's offered in the way of the electronic experience, the iPhone experience, alongside the real performance. Interestingly, I went to Wimbledon Tennis last year. There was a, a lady, girl in front of me. She was about 15. We watched about three hours of tennis, and she watched about two and a half hours of it through her, the tiny screen on her, on her vid, videoing on her camera. And it, it was almost as though she couldn't acknowledge a live performance. She had to somehow filter it through, through the electronic experience she was familiar with. And finally, I suggest that for new audiences, they would like to participate in the building as well as being uh, passive receivers of the art. So I hope that um, stirred some interest, so, and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we've got about five minutes if uh, anybody had any questions or if anybody wants to start a discussion within the... I think there's a microphone somewhere. Um, is there? If you could just... Uh, I've been asked to ask if you could say your name or your organisation before you speak. That would be helpful. Hi, I'm Alan Byrne. I'm here as an artist. Um, a few months ago, I performed at a club called The Stone in New York, which is run by John Zorn as a non-profit organisation. It's one of the most in-demand venues for kind of crossover music, undefinable music from jazz to sort of new classical music. It seats about 25 people on uh, uh, fold-out chairs. The toilet is on the stage, and there is absolutely no sense of decoration there at all. In fact, there isn't even a stage. Uh, and, and I know that Zorn wants the audience to be seated at the same level as the artist. There's an, an ideological conviction there. And um, what makes this space so attractive is that great artists want to perform there. They, they appreciate that there is a consistent ideology that is reflected, even if they think it's a little bit nuts and extreme, but it, it has an identity. And I think that one of the things that um, is important to people is to have the feeling that whatever it is, it's not generic. Hmm. It has a very strong identity and invites you, a space invites you to participate in the identity of that space. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I, yeah, I suppose that's a little bit like the comment I was making about the found space, you know, that people are looking for new experiences and new ways of, I mean, it is more interactive, as, as you describe it, than it would be in a, in, in a traditional um, concert hall. And I think people welcome those kind of opportunities. 
and it sounds like it's a pretty low energy space and uh, you know it's a uh, so I would have thought it's a nice example of, 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 of several of the threads that I've been trying to suggest today. So, and I think there'll be more of them, is my view. Hello, my name is Netta Norren. I'm from Sweden and work as a producer at the County Music in Gävleborg. And I just want to say that you're totally right about all this building of cultural houses and that's happening in Sweden too. And the problem, of course, is there's no money to fill the houses with anything. So it's just like a landmark. So that's our biggest problem. And then number two, you talked about this, uh, the Met, for instance. They do uh, broadcasting to cinemas. And we do that also in our county. And it's very popular. And it's like they don't only eat popcorn. It's like a whole setup with restaurants yeah. and they do a nice performance. Mm. I think that's really a good thing for the people that can't afford to really go to the Met concerning what the ticket, ticket prices are. Yeah. <laughs> so mm. it's, I think that's a great idea. And I think this might be the future also for younger, uh, the younger audience. Yeah, I think that um, it's been, we've seen this around the world in Japan, you know, in the 1980s, 90s. They built, you know, recital halls, symphonic halls and, and opera theatres all around the country without really for sort of political, provincial political reasons probably, without really having the audiences to fill them. And they have a difficulty now. We have a difficulty in the United Kingdom where we, as designers, had this wonderful time of, you know, the, the lottery money. And we built all these very fine buildings. And then the um, artistic groups moved in and found that they, you know, couldn't, afford to run them and we're laying off dancers or musicians or something to, to pay for this wonderful new building. And in a sense for my industry, you know, it's difficult times now, but I think it's in the long term will be better that now perhaps we spend more money on the orchestras and we spend more money on the, on the art itself. And in another X years, it'll be the turn of the buildings again. Um, yes, I'm Marco Frey, I'm a music journalist here in Munich, and actually you talked about, you have talked about shortly about the very important aspect, I think, of um, new techniques, of di digitalization of arts, sorry, it's a very difficult hard, word, yeah. difficult <laughs> word. Um, actually, I talked some weeks ago with the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra, they, of course, we all know, the one, I think they were the first orchestra, the big orchestra, um, making a digital concert hall with audiovisual, um, <laughs> yes, transmissions of concerts. Is it right I am saying? Yes, okay. exactly. Okay. So actually some of them uh, told me in interviews that yes, if we had in the Philharmonie in Berlin a shoebox design, we could not, we wouldn't have be able <laughs> to um, do such a um, project and we are still working on the potentials of using the cam cam camera all around the stage because as we know the stage in the Berlin Philharmonie is right in the middle. Do you agree to this that at, at least, I, I mean they say that the shoebox design is maybe too old-fashioned for concert halls um, and um, the question of digital concert halls. What do you think about that? Do you agree or not? No, I don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I Why? Think, I think that's down to the uh, the skill of the of the, of the cameramen and the the video editor. And I would have thought you could you could um, produce a very compelling transmission in 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 a shoebox hall. Um, and if it's, it's, if it's a beautiful shoebox hall, I'm sure you, you could add to that. And I think that um, many symphonic concerts could be enhanced, even to the audience that's present, by using the techniques which are used on, you know, for example, live broadcast of symphonic music, where you have a screen, and you know, if there's a bassoon solo, then you, you, you put up a, you know, a close-up of the bassoon. Some audiences would not like that, but I think a lot of audiences would, would learn a lot from it and would appreciate the music even more. But as I alluded to, I think that a lot of orchestras are really quite conservative in approaching that. 
And of course, I think one of the reasons we don't see more Berlin Philharmonic uh, is because of you know problems with artists' concern about you know um, copyright and, and royalties and so on and so forth. But I think um, it's got to be the way forward. It seems obvious to me that you know it, my local concert hall. Sometimes I would go and see a concert, but I would love if it was pouring with rain and very cold, decide that night not to go to the concert, but but pay my subscription and watch it online. It just seems an obvious development to me. We've probably got time for maybe one more point, if anybody. Hi, I'm Stephanie Jenke here from the Gasteig in the house. Um, my question is about the design of the typical classical um, halls, especially concerning the, the audience. Now it's still, everything you all also presented is quite um, old-fashioned, I'd say. Do you think there will be a change like the way the audience is going to um, be seated? Um, you told about the small club. It's working for a small space, but how will be the future concert hall? Do you think there will be a change, um, for example, sitting of the, of the people? I think it... it, it comes back to my point about whether we can afford and want to maintain excellence in things. I mean, I think there's no doubt that acoustically, you know, the laws of physics drive both in opera houses and in concert halls um, the, the geometry to an extent of where the audience sit. Now, there's different types of hall. There might be the shoebox hall, there may be the vineyard hall, the arena hall. But in a sense, um, <clears throat> there, there's some limitation on that. Uh, I, I went to... Um, the, the new hall in Helsinki, you know, the Music Italo. And that is a bit like Berlin, that the, the platform, some of you will know it, is quite near the middle, which means there's a lot of seats behind the orchestra. I'd like to think it will change, but I think that for a lot of events, you, you come back to the way they're produced and the way people want to hear things. I mean, if, if you want to hear a string quartet, you want to hear it in a certain you know, order of the instruments, and the instruments themselves are directional, so you want to hear it in a certain way. And if you hear it from behind, it sounds pretty, pretty strange. Um, so I'd like to think there'd be some changes, but I think in that aspect, it won't change that much. I mean, a good example is in theatre where, um, you know, in, in small theatres, uh, we often design them to be very, very flexible, you know, so they could be in the round or traverse or end stage or... Uh, but at the end of the day, you find out that 80% of the time they're being used in an end stage format. And the reason is that, you know, it's a touring production and it goes around the different theatres and it's only there one night and there's no time to move all the seats around and do all these exciting things. So unfortunately... I suppose the economics of it bring it back to, you know, a more conventional layout a lot of the time. But it's nice to think that they, you know these possibilities will exist for the future. Okay. Well, I think we probably have to stop there because I've got to change over to the next um, session. So anyway, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.